Baptiste Perez. Do you mind, um, since the Tango flight is virtual, moving that up so that and then everything else is in person? So. Good evening, this is a call to order, a teaching and learning committee meeting of the Board of Education. Today's date is May 16th, 2022. The time now is 6.30. In attendance, uh, Joseph Sokolovic, committee member, Joseph Lombard, present, for staff, Michael Testani and myself, Chair, Christine Baptiste Perez. The first item on the agenda is approval of minutes from Teaching and Learning Committee meeting on May 5th, 2022. Do we have a motion or do we have any comments regarding it? Any changes? Yeah. Not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from May 5th, 2022? Motion to approve minutes from May 5th, 2022. Is it second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Any abstentions? Abstain. The motion passes. We're going to, in the interest of time, we're actually going to jump to the fourth item on the agenda, which is an update mm -hmm. on, on Bassic High School, Bassic High School's Tango Flight Project. After I have a motion to amend. <laughs> the agenda motion to amend the agenda to move the tango fight up item up to number two and the other items preceding it immediately and following it immediately second all in favor aye. 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 the motion passes so now this the next item on the agenda is the update on basic high school's tango flight project wonderful um good evening board members thank you so much for uh, inviting us here um on the call today, I have uh, myself, Dr. Ayola, Principal of Bassick High School, um, and, and Aaron Hollander. I'll ask him to introduce himself, and also uh, David Pequa. Um, Aaron and David, you want to introduce yourselves? Yes. Uh, I hello. I'll, I'll go first and then uh, turn it over to David. So I'm Aaron Hollander. Uh, I'm actually on the board of, of uh, Tango Flight, which uh, they had asked me to join after we had got uh, this program started. I've got a 30 year plus uh, aviation background and was first exposed to the Bridgeport school system many years ago. And I've always wanted to do something uh, with the students and uh, hopefully this has uh, been worthwhile for everyone. I'll turn it over to David. Hello board, uh, my name is David Pacwa. I live in Norwalk, uh, own a business in Stanford. Um, as a sideline, I restore uh, anti <clears throat> and um, I have an uh, FAA AMP, um, uh, which is a mechanics ticket as well as a, a pilot's license. And it's my first year um, with the school, and I, I really have to say I enjoy um, this program. We're working with the children, uh, or the kids, and um, and moving this project forward. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. Um, Ms. Valle or, or Sam, are you able to get me permission to uh, share my screen, make me a presenter, and I could share some photographs and uh, take our esteemed board members through a, um, you know, some photos and an update of everything? I am currently working on that. All right. Um, how how familiar is the board with the with the program, and have they seen? Uh, uh, the aircraft as it any time along. I'm not not quite sure how what you'd like us to present. So, well, I'll sure. tell you as a new board member, I've only heard of it, but I've seen photos and I've read about it from what was posted on like the news outlets. So the Connecticut Post had wrote an article about Project Tango. Um, 
So it'd be good to see photos and to see the update as to where the students are. Okay. Well, they're, they're ready to give you the update just to give you the, yes, the updated. So when uh, Secretary of Education, Dr. Cardona was Commissioner of Education, he presented an opportunity to Bridgeport um, after him and I had a conversation regarding just some um, shared philosophical ideas regarding students that may not have um, initially college in their futures or in their future plans. So the um, project was presented and because of the accessibility and the current uh, auto program at BASIC, um, we thought it was a nice fit to offer it to BASIC High School where they would spend the time working closely with the Tango Flight folks, volunteers, um, to come in and build a two-person um, workable aircraft, which at the end of the project will be sold and the proceeds will then um, fund another uh, Tango Flight project build at Bassett High School. So that's kind of the brief overview of where this project originated and um, students and, and volunteers have worked tirelessly to get us to today's presentation that Dr. Raola and team will present. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Testani. I, um, it'd be rude of me not to thank you for bringing this project over to BASIC. It's really had an impact on our students and um, the overall climate within within the auto shop. Um, like the superintendent was saying, this is a, a real great partnership that we've, that we've established. Um, we've got a, a large group of mentors that rotate through, uh, working hands-on with the kids. Um, David and Aaron are both mentors and, and also... Uh, Aaron is someone who uh, initiated this project um, through the governor's office and, and got it down to us with the superintendent's coordination. Um, you know, the students are receiving firsthand experience in, um, in, in aviation, um, not only through the, the skills, the hands-on skills, but with the mentors that are, are present. And David and Aaron are both industry leaders uh, working with our students on a regular basis. So what I'll share with you now is how far we've made it. So uh, how far we've gone this year, um, Aaron and David, you know, chime in if I, I misstep or I misspeak. I, I don't pretend to be a uh, flight expert or an aviation expert like you two gentlemen. You two gentlemen. Um, so this is what we're building, or this is what the team is building. Um, you can see there's a completed aircraft. Um, it's a Vans RV-12, which is, uh, um, uh, it's really like a hobbyist aircraft. So people purchase these and uh, build them in their, their, um, on their own. Um, then end up flying them. You can see just a small two-person aircraft, but um, I, I don't know all the, the specs on how fast and how far it's able to travel, but it's, it's the real deal. Um, this was a few weeks ago. As you can see, the um, landing gears come together. Here's a picture of a, you know, some of our students outside with the landing gear on the fuselage of the plane in the cockpit area. Um, you know, some of the skills that the students get from this are, are technical reading and technical drawing skills. I um, picked out that picture on the left just to show you a little demonstration of, of what the students get. Um, so if you haven't seen this yet, the, the airplane comes in many sections throughout the course of a, a one-year period. Um, boxes of individual parts come. Um, I, I think literally tens of thousands of individual uh, fasteners and Clicos and, and all these other parts come and, and organizing those parts and being able to read the drawings on how to put those together is just such a great transferable skill for our kids. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side here, a group of our students with, um, you know, an officer who, who uh, was actually, I think he was in, in the military and, and he does some of this work on the side. Um, here we are with our completed tail and cockpit, or, or not completed cockpit, but as far as we've gotten with the cockpit, all the mechanicals are in. Um, and right now they are waiting for the uh, avionics for that, that's like your uh, GPS system. Um, Garmin is the supplier for that. And um, due to the COVID and pandemic, they're backed up. So probably won't get the avionics in and be airborne until next year, but um, they're making some real, real great progress in the plane. Um, this was a real exciting day. Um, Aaron and uh, called me down. He said, you gotta come down, you gotta come down. This is a big thing in aviation. We are putting the uh, motor uh, or the motor of the engine onto the plane. So you could see here's the motor. It comes pretty much all assembled and 
and ready to go. There's, of course, a lot of, of uh, setup to do, but um, these are the motor mounts over here, and they're getting ready to mount this right onto the uh, right onto the front of the plane. There it is up on the lift, getting ready to go. And just um, so you get a feel that this is kind of a parts organizer in the back of the shop. Um, you know, we, we have some students that help keep that organized. Um, that's a full-time job over at Sikorsky. So um, again, one of those transferable skills that we keep trying to get our students so that they're able to get these uh, high paying career jobs that um, a, lot, a lot of people are looking for. Um, here we are swinging the motor into place. And we flip again and you can see the motors being dropped into place and um, a couple of our students are torquing the motor mounts and getting everything locked in. Um, it's hard to, hard to believe that this motor is just mounted to the cockpit with like four or five bolts. Uh, made me a little nervous, but uh, that's how these guys do it in aviation. So you're not one of the first ones to go for a ride, are you? I, we were going to um, request board members to take the inaugural visit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's another image of the uh, motor being mounted on. You can see just a few few bolts ready to go. And here we are right now, current state of uh, current state of the aircraft. Motors on, and uh, you know we're we're moving forward. Um, so next steps over the next year, or the next uh, for the remainder of this year, and starting up next year, going to continue work on our fuselage, get the gas tank installed, and finish up that cockpit area with the seats and the mechanical flight controls. Um, like I had mentioned, the avionics is on back order from Garmin, so uh, hopefully that'll get here. Um, you know, by the time next the next school year starts, we can start getting that installed. Um, all the wings and all of the the large aluminum parts are are complete. Um, they're being stored outside, and um, you know we we have a, a shipping container that we keep everything locked up in. Um, after everything's put together, it'll receive a nice coat of paint, and we're hoping for a flight next year. Um, one of the outcomes of this was, was an unintended consequence, but uh, we have a partnership with um, uh, uh, Tech Schools Collaborative, which is a little uh, group out of Hartford, um, and they're actually running a uh, aviation program this summer at uh, Sikorsky Airport. So we're trying to recruit some kids to go over and participate in that program over at Sikorsky. Um, they're going to get it's a pre-apprenticeship program. So they're starting to get some skills in order to slide over to a full apprenticeship program in a variety of careers in the aviation field. Um, and last but not least, you know, you guys are, of course, welcome and invited to come to BASIC at any time. Um, take a look in the shop, meet the students. We were hoping to have one or two online tonight, but uh, they didn't make it. We did invite a few, um, but we'd love to have you down to the school one day. Um, even if you wanted to do a, a board meeting there or something, you'd be welcome to. It'd be um, a great opportunity for you to experience all this firsthand. I don't think a picture, uh, pictures do it do it justice all the time. The work that um, the mentors do and, and our teacher Steve Bloom might be, uh, you know, I'd be remiss not to mention the work, hard work he's done to get this going. Do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, comments, questions. Questions, comments. Uh, yeah, that would that would be. Um I know it's kind of tongue in cheek, but I'd be happy to fly on anything our students built. I got full faith and confidence in our students. I know they did it. They're doing it right. I know they're being overseen by a nice, good team of professionals. So I'm sure they'll do well. <laughs> and um, well, do we have an anticipated completion date? Uh, it, it's anywhere. I mean, any more ballpark than 22, 23 school year? Well, I think uh, we probably won't be able to fledge it until after the first of the year next year, the 20, 2023. I, I think we're probably going to need most of the uh, fall semester to get it screwed together, the avionics mounted, and then there's a series of checks that we're going to have to go through, make sure things are exactly right according to the drawings and whatnot. But um, Aaron, do you think uh, any – I don't see us any faster than that. But that, that, I, I think that's going to be – what I was going to, a couple things if I can can add. One is it's if you've ever built a house or, or seen the house or go up, it looks like it goes very slow in the beginning, and then it looks like it's moving fast, and then it feels like painfully slow. <laughs> and sort of that's, it's sort of similar with this because the avionics, for example, like everything else we're hearing is way backlogged. We were supposed to have them in months ago, as Dr. Joe mentioned, and all that work 
the wings are actually done. There was two trailers that that uh, that you allocated some money for, which we appreciate. So the wings are done, the tail is done. Now we're doing like the inside of the aircraft, which is very meticulous and like details around the cowling. So uh, I think if we can, we'll be starting in the engines probably, you know, early in the year and, and hopefully it'll be fully, fully completed. I want to just do a couple of thank you because I know being on the board of uh, Tango Flight, it often is a long process for the Board of Eds to approve these. And I know the superintendent and everyone, you all got behind this quickly, which we appreciate. And, and we continue to work all during COVID when a lot of things were shut down. This is a hands-on program and you let us continue, which we appreciate. Um, Dr. Joe has been amazing. What you don't see in the presentation is he comes down all the time and visits, which really lets the students know they're doing something important. Um, that, that visibility is huge. And I think most of you know, know uh, Steve Bloom, who's, uh, he's, nobody goes to work loving what he's doing more, shouting louder and loving everything he does. So a big appreciation there. So I just wanted to add those, those thank yous to you and, and to the team. We've got incredible mentors. David is, is amazing. He's actually built these aircraft. But we have engineers who work at Sikorsky, um, people who are aviation enthusiasts, people working on on remote uh, helicopter vehicles. So um, this program is really only possible for that. So we need to spread the word and keep finding more mentors to keep this program going. Thank you. Absolutely. And I appreciate everything everything's, everybody's been doing for our students and the mentors, especially the volunteers. Um, yeah, when would it be best to have an, the next update? I don't want to refer too early with no when there's uh, no visible differences, like maybe three, four months. I would say definitely, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let the record reflect that board member Albert Benningham is present virtually. Mr. Lombard, do you have any questions or comments? Yes. So thank you very much for everything so far. I remember when this was first being um, introduced to us, talked about in addition to the obvious, which was building the plane and learning about building the plane, there would also be some uh, classroom type discussion around careers in aviation and different aspects of the field, aside from the engineering side. I was wondering what type of classroom activity is happening, if, if at all, in that area. No, we've done a lot of that. Dr. Joe, you want to answer that? Yes, yeah, so um, a lot of it is done. Um, there, there's been some formal discussions. We have a career counselor at BASIC now, um, and she's come in and done some some presentations and discussions with uh, career pathways around aviation. Um, I, I think the most powerful, though, are the informal discussions that our mentors are having with the students, um, talking about about different different pathways that these students could get into. I, I um, was there just the other day and. Uh, one of the mentors was discussing um, Emory Riddle with, with one of the students, how, how to get into, uh, you know, some of these top notch, um, top notch colleges and top notch schools that, that I, I don't think, I, you know, a lot of us aren't even aware of, um, you know, the, the career paths and, and those things are always discussed and, and a big part of what I think is a daily ex expectation from the kids. Well, we, well, if I can add to that, Dr. Joe, what we also did is we've done both last year and this year, we've done field trips to Bridge to Sikorsky Airport. And one of the suggestions David had made was to do it earlier in the year, which we did. So we visited the tech school there. We visited an actual maintenance facility, Three Wing, opened up their facility. We visited Atlantic Aviation, which is the, which they call an FBO, where the corporate aircraft are. They got to see the various jobs there. They went to the tower uh, where the, the control tower allowed the students to go up and actually observe what happens. And they looked on their phone, saw how much a control tower person gets paid, which I think they're pretty excited about. So, uh, and then also we do have a number of military, ex-military guys, uh, Sergeant uh, Ken Fortas, who you saw in that picture comes and so uh, some of the students are looking at going into engineering. Some are looking to uh, 
go into the military. Some don't know what they're doing yet, but um, so quite a variety. And uh, Aaron, if I may, um, not really being on the education side of things, it was it was really new to me coming in and seeing students that really didn't even have an idea how to put a drill into a to a, a an electric drill or how to use a socket wrench. To see where they are today is really pretty cool. I mean, the other part of this too is that is that it's it's there, there's more teamwork involved. I, I try to group a couple of the students together, keep them together fully, and then they review the drawings, they read the items, the step-by-step -step items, they they hunt out for the parts. We do a dry assembly to get to give them an idea, you know, it's extra work, but to give them an idea what this thing is going to look like when they've completed this portion of the job. Um, it's it's interesting to see how most of the students really didn't know each other. Now they're they're buddying up and it's working very well. I also have to give a big shout out to Steve Bloom. He has really been terrific there. Um, but it's true. There's there's so many other areas in aviation than just flying a, a jet for a living. And uh, they're, they're starting to see that. And uh, yeah, I'm, we're constantly getting questions about can, can I, you know, what would a mechanic get paid? What would a, an air traffic controller get paid and all? And where would I be best? You know, so they're thinking about it. And, and the, the counselors come down frequently and help them out. And uh, I, I really like the program. I really do enjoy uh, the volunteering with them. So surprise me, too. <laughs> Thank you. Just to add to that, I think Dr. Rail forgot last summer we were able to partner with uh, Ansonia Public Schools in an opportunity through Rosa Delora's office to send uh, staff members from BASIC to a three-day externship at Sikorsky so that they would learn about the career opportunities that they can go back and share with their students and help counsel and mentor and guide students possibilities uh, from $900 a week summer internships uh, all the way up to um, you know high paying jobs and the possibilities of free education paid for through Sikorsky. So that was another component to being able to educate students on the possibilities that exist, um, maybe not immediately. Yeah, I, I think so, so part of what he said is that it's kind of the conversations that happen on the fly. I remember talking about, well, you know, baggage handlers, flight attendants, people behind the ticket counter, the whole all around aviation, just opening up their eyes to things. So like that as well. Hey, it was an eye-opening experience on the last day when I, we went, uh, myself and the superintendent, Nansonia, and got the tour of the Sikorsky facility because it's not what you think if you haven't if you haven't been inside. I mean, working in there, it's extremely clean environment, um, environmentally safe. No one's really killing themselves and um you know to see them assembling the blackhawks it's, it's it's pretty cool stuff no one's really killing themselves no absolutely not <laughs> they, they are very technical um everything's ergonomically set up where they don't have to bend lift it's all efficiently done they have a kit whether you work a four or eight hour shift and that is the expectation whatever's in that kit gets assembled um and that if it takes you 10 hours, then that's on you. If it takes you six, then you can relax. And it's pretty, pretty cool stuff that we got to see. And the, our staff, I think, had a new, uh, an eye-opening experience that they can share and help guide and, and mentor and um, help students make some career opportunity decisions that probably didn't exist when you just drive by on, on, on the parkway. Mr. Benahan, you had your hands up for a while. Any questions or comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for the record, I was in your meeting for 6.32 around there, now 6.46 when you call me. But I have a question and a comment. Um, And I know I already went through, I went to a school and then I see the amazing job they're doing, um, uh, Mr. Bloom and the team. But I wonder, this is my second time that I see they do a presentation and I don't see Mr. Bloom be part of this presentation because I know after he's getting, he's very strong and he's fighting and he's working very hard to be sure this um, amazing project that basic history they're doing. 
please the next time video enjoy Mr. Bloom because I know he's working and he's very excited. He's doing so many things. He take care of his health very good, everybody know. And next time, please be sure he's part of this presentation on anything. We need to have Mr. Mr. Bloom around us, please. That's the only thing I want to say. Thank you. For the record, Mr. Bloom's here, not here by choice. He's not one to get in front of the camera and take any of the, the credit. Um, but he'll be more than happy if you go up for a visit. Maybe we can schedule a teaching and learning committee meeting at the school uh, at Basic the next in the fall and uh, get firsthand, um, have some students there to kind of give you the guided tour of the work that's been done because it's it's pretty amazing. The, the pictures do not show it, give it justice as Dr. Rayola mentioned. It would not be in uh, behind camera, like you said, that, uh, Mr. Stani, but trust me, he will be in Central High School. And I would like to have him please the next time be with us because he's working very hard and he's very excited about this plane. He feel like a, he's, he feels like getting and fly it away. <laughs> that's the way he feel with this uh, project. and. I just want to be sure, you know, he be part of this uh, next time um, project or any presentation. Thank you. No more, more comment, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments regarding no, it? No, ma'am. No. Well, thank you all. Uh, this is exciting. I look forward to having one of my teaching and learning committee meetings mm -hmm. at BASIC so I can actually see it firsthand. Um, oh, yes, please. Come. Good. Well, we, well, we welcome it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, guys. We're going to move to the third item on the agenda, which is discussion and possible action on Central High School's field trip to Nashville, Tennessee. If we have someone in person. Yep. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Carmen Marietta Francisco. I am um, the English department chair here at Central High School. I'm also the advisor for HOSA Health Occupation Students of America. And the students have worked this year to raise money to go to the International Leadership Conference. And um, a lot of people think that when the students go on these trips that it's just fun and games. But um, these young ladies have worked really hard this year. They've participated in um, medical discussion panels with professionals from Yale New Haven Health. Um, they have engaged in community service projects, raising money for um, Ukraine for medical supplies and food relief. They have done community service to collect food for the food bank and the rescue mission here in Bridgeport, and they've also worked um, on Be the Match for bone marrow and blood donor um, campaigns. So the students work really hard on these projects. And um, the reason they go to the ILC is that these students are gonna get to uh, interact with armed forces um, representatives regarding scholarship and potentially getting their um, college paid for. Um, we have a student who has already trained to be an EMT, and she is going to be doing her licensure potentially over this summer. Um, we have students who want to go to also investigate college and career. There are going to be many colleges uh, present that provide financial um, support for the students so that they can go for reduced tuition and sometimes uh, students are accepted on the spot to go to the universities. Um, so the students, uh, for the most part, the three ladies who are going, uh, want to go for the leadership development. There are a lot of courses for developing their roles as leaders in HOSA. Um, we have two young ladies who are actually engaging in leadership while they're there. They've been chosen as the Connecticut State Voting Delegates. So they will be attending two days worth of meetings where they will be selecting the um, national leaders for HOSA. 
Uh, they will also be selecting the next community service projects for the next two years, and they'll be engaging in training on how to uh, lead our local chapter because neither one of the young ladies has actually been an officer, but they will engage in uh, training to be officers and also how to lead different events um, for HOSA. So um, our other student who is going, while she did not win any uh, competitions in order to participate, she is going so that she can also develop her leadership skills and have an opportunity to meet with colleges. She wants to be a traveling nurse and she knows that the armed forces have a lot of opportunities for her um, to afford her a chance at a, a paid uh, college through her master's degree. In the past, the armed forces have handed out up to $600,000 a year to HOSA students. And that was to a small group of about 12 students. So, um, you know, this is a great opportunity for our students to go and to engage in many activities that will allow them to gain skills um, that we're saying we want them to have for their vision of the graduate. They're gonna get to collaborate. They're going to get to engage in critical thinking uh, activities where they uh, solve problems and they learn. Um, they're going to get to do things which show them to be culturally competent citizens. So a lot of the things that they're doing, it's not just, hey, let's go to Nashville and buy some cowboy boots. It's, it's really about engaging and learning activities and also interacting with students from other states and other countries. Any questions or comments, Mr. Lombard? Dr. Mr. Kolovic? Uh, yes. I think this is about the smallest field trip we've had before us since I've been on the world. <laughs> was it open to other students? It was open to all 33 uh, members of our chapter. Um, many of the students uh, could not go due to financial uh, you know, responsibilities and their parents could not meet it. And We've been doing fundraising and they, some of the students have obligations at home and really couldn't participate in a lot of fundraising activities in order to support their desire to go. Uh, in the end, some parents also had concerns about uh, COVID and, you know, would the protocols be followed there and what they would have to pay. Uh, the prices for the convention, staying at the, the Gaylord Opryland Resort is, it's not cheap. Um, just for the rooms, it's, it's $1,300 per room. So thank goodness the three girls would be sharing a room. So that reduces the expenditure. Um, we also were able to find some and expenses flights through Avello, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, so um, that was really, you know, part of my job was to help make it more affordable for the kids who were going. Um, and even though we opened it up to more students, these are the only three who really um, put forth the effort to do any fundraising in order to go and really showed a strong desire to go um, for not just the leadership, but also for the college and career exploration. So that's why it's a small trip. In the past, we went to Florida and we had six or seven girls who went. Um, we now have some of those, uh, one of those students is at Fairfield U um, and she's studying to be a doctor. So um, we've had other students go on uh, to uh, practice nursing. So it's it's really for me it's it's making sure that they get the opportunities to do the college and career exploration and to develop those leadership skills. And um, when they come back, will they be sharing what they've learned at the? They will. They will be bringing back uh, what they learned to uh, share with the chapter next year. Um, all of the college and careers, uh, the colleges that show up, they um, allow us to set up with them online meetings so that they can then speak to the membership. And it's better, I think, for the girls to give them some firsthand discussion because I know that as an adult, sometimes we tell them everything that they should know and they still turn the volume down. But when one of their peers shares the information with them, 
Um, they tend to take a little more stock because also the girls will have uh, firsthand discussion with these representatives that they speak to. They also bring back flyers and things for the girls um, and the young men in the group. Um, part of the panel discussions that we were able to engage in this year is that one of our students attended a conference and was able to um, connect with Martha Judd over at Yale New Haven Health and brought that back to our current club. And Martha Judd has um, made it possible for our students to get trained in CPR, first aid, um, use of an AED defibrillator, stop the bleed, and uh, the Heimlich maneuver. Um, and they are actually on May 26th paying for 30 students here at Central High School, whether they're HOSA or non-HOSA, to be certified for two years in those skills. Um, they were also able to bring back from that um, another group that trained students um, in the same procedures. And we had that in the fall and we trained 32 students who were trained and certified and one adult teacher um, here from the school. So we are bringing things back that are useful to our students. Um, we are making some useful connections. Yale New Haven Health, our connection that we were able to get, um, has also provided um, an opportunity for any student from Central High School who's interested in becoming a pharmacy tech. They pay for all of the um, courses for the student to be certified as a pharmacy tech. So, you know, little by little, we're getting more and more things brought to our students by the connections that we make from the convention and also um, through, well, through the people that we meet there, they're able to help us to network a little better. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Benaham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you say um, that your school's trying to help for the, those can afford to go to the tree, right? Yes. All right, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, thank you so much that your school and your team try to help all those students they can afford because I know the economic is very tight right now this year. So I just want to, you know, bring that comfort record. Okay? Thank you so much for trying to help all the students, you know, they cannot make it. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. In fact, one of one of our students, if I may, um, couldn't go at all because she had no money to go and her mother just could not do it. She couldn't even pay the fee for her daughter to go. We were able to help her to find sponsors throughout this school and also at Fairfield University. Her last six hundred dollars, um, she was able to approach uh, the dean and they got a team of professors that's now Team Tiara um, to pay the last $600 for her to go. So it's not me doing the work, it's the students putting forth the effort and making those connections as well. Um, and we've got a lot of people who want to support them. Uh, Ms. Smith, who is the magnet uh, director here, she actually brought HOSA to the state of Connecticut. And so she has also been a big cheerleader for our students and is also helping to uh, support our students. So we have uh, four teachers in the building and some other staff who are helping to support that. So, um, you know, again, it's not just me, it's the kids and it's other staff here at Central that are helping to promote that. Uh, I just have a general comment, and I'll keep it brief because it's not necessarily on the particular action item, but I think it would be good maybe in a, another meeting to discuss HOSA and the opportunity that's presented to students and maybe the breakdown of the membership, only because I keep hearing ladies, ladies have attended a trip, and I, I would wonder how the opportunity could impact some of the young men in our school. Uh, but as far as this particular field trip, um, the information provided, the permission slips are in. Um, I think this will be a wonderful opportunity for our students. Thank you. And if I may, we have four or five, five actually, male members um, 
who two of them had other obligations and could not go on the trip, but the other um, young men could not go due to financial constraints. So, so it is open to them. Uh, it's just when I say the young ladies, it's just because those are the three who have have actually completed. But there's 33 members. Correct. Only five out of 33 are boys. Right. And and it's not that we don't promote uh, to both genders because we do. It's open to all students. And when we have our medical panel discussions, there are both male and female um, who are there representing different careers so that the young men can see themselves also in these careers. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from board members? No. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to present to the full board uh, a approval for a Central High School's field trip to Nashville, Tennessee. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. The motion passes. Uh, you will present this to the full board next Monday. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great night. Okay. The next item on the agenda is discussion and possible action on the Discovery Education Science contract. Mr. Henry, our Director of Aquaculture and Science is here to present finding. Mr. Henry. Hello, good evening. I appreciate all of your time uh, for a busy Monday. Uh, nice to see you all again. Um, Sam, do you have a copy of my presentation? All right, I can forward it to you right now if you'd like. In the wire to you, sir. be a few attachments that should be the PowerPoint. Might take a minute with all that. But. Oh, Rita, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so I did send this out. I uh, will go through it um, somewhat expeditiously, but I, again, I appreciate everyone being here and I appreciate um, all of your time. Um, and so if you want to uh, continue on there, Rita, the rationale for the request um, should be the next slide. All right. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> the wonders of technology. <laughs> If it was going to dump more, I was going to just take it from the home and present myself from here, but...
Well, well the, we pull up the slideshow just as an addition um, because this is a huge undertaking of K through 12 science curriculum uh, with the ability for the next couple of years with uh, availability of um, funds through ARP ESSER, we will be posting and providing support to Mr. Henry through the a coordinator of K-8 science um, that we could then absorb if necessary as an assistant principal um, through attrition if need be when funding runs out. But I think it's going to be important to really uh, support and uh, stress the importance of science in our elementary middle school level um, over the next couple of years as this gets rolled out. And we are making adjustments as well to uh, to ensure that science is being taught in all grade levels um, beginning next year and not just being touched upon, but students are getting access to high quality science curriculum um, throughout their academic careers in the four public schools. I appreciate the support, Buzz. Yes, Thank sir. You. I don't have any questions. I'll just need to get it out. Yeah, I looked at the presentation earlier. I can explain and answer questions if we want to do that half. You know, we had it up there kind of small. So uh, when I was looking at the... Yes, <laughs> uh, Ms. Kalvik, questions? Comments? Yeah. Um, I noticed there's uh, no score sheets. And it was who was what was the second most? Ah, uh, it's one of the slides. I've got the results of the four um, the four companies that we surveyed. Um, it's one of my slides. It's HMH, Activate, Learning, Service, and Discovery. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, so this is the presentation again, thank you all. Um, the next slide is the rationale for the request. So uh, I was told upon becoming the science um, director that there was a, a fiscal revision cycle for the 22-23 school year. Um, and so we um, also looking at obviously at NGSS and um, how we align that with our science education here. And uh, right now we don't have a, a necessarily a K-12 program that supports that. Um, and that's really what we sought to look for is a, a core program to ensure kind of consistency throughout um, uh, for our learners throughout their time here. Um, so I did form and go to the next one. Thank you. If you've got a clicker, I can move them to soon. Thank you. Uh, so a science leadership team was formed. Um, I got, um, uh, again, a great group of science leaders from teachers from the district. Um, uh, Ms. Caston is an assistant principal as well. Um, and we decided on four uh, companies, kind of the main uh, players that we have uh, already in our schools uh, and the best science products that we, um, you know, evaluated. Um, and the leadership team then um, had live presentations from each of the companies from uh, throughout the first semester of this school year. Thank you, sir. This might be a little small for you all. But so the uh, four companies that we did entertain um, up there, uh, HMH, uh, which is our current K-5 science company, uh, Activate Learning, which are the makers of iQuest, which are our current 6-8 science product, uh, Savas, which is formerly known as Pearson, and uh, Discovery Education. Um, and what we decided to do is while we heard live uh, in person, there were still plenty of kind of COVID uh, and spatial considerations within this, but we wanted to not be the only decision makers as a leadership team, but really uh, allow all science teachers throughout the district to evaluate and have their say in these products. So uh, while we were hearing presentations over at Aqua in person, uh, simultaneously, kind of all remotely, uh, presenters from the companies were presenting to our science teachers and mass uh, over uh, through teams. Um, so again, to expose everybody to uh, the breadth of the options that we have. 
Um, and then we did put a we put a survey together. Um, and I did ask teachers to answer by grade band, knowing that there are kind of nuances uh, at our different grade bands. Um, so uh, we looked at the following. I don't know if that was me or a coincidence, but okay. See, it's not that. It should be security. <laughs> Sorry, Rita, can you put yourself on mute? Thank you. Um, so the survey questions uh, regarded the uh, quality of the product and the uh, opinions of the survey uh, responders for our special needs learners, um, the quality of the product for our English language learners, uh, the quality of their online and digital resources, uh, the user friendliness of the platform, um, the relation to everyday life for our students in Bridgeport Public Schools, the NGSS uh, alignment, uh, as well as the uh, quality of the learning progression for our students, thinking about uh, as they go through uh, any of these grade bands. Um, and so it's, it's kind of small there, but um, what I looked at or that we had 21 different total um, categories. So there were seven questions in three grade bands. So 21 possible um, kind of categories. And I was happy to see when I tabulated these results that Discovery was a clear winner. Uh, so they won 10 of those categories and the next closest company was less than half of that with Activate Learning. Um, and I thought it was interesting to note that the special needs learners, as well as the relation to every day, and again, that wasn't relation to everyday life for our staff, but for our students, uh, those ratings uh, were, Discovery won those ratings at each of the three grade bands, which I thought was pretty telling. <laughs> Um, uh, and so just some more uh, kind of notes about Discovery. Again, they were a clear standout from the pack. Um, they do have extensive, extensive digital resources for uh, our teachers as well as our uh, students. Uh, the team that we work with from Discovery Education has been uh, very professional, uh, extremely communicative, communicative throughout the, uh, the process. Um, uh, we've met on multiple occasions to kind of uh, negotiate the, um, the deal as well as um, just to kind of talk about the future of Bridgeport Public Schools um, and specific to science. Um, and we were able to negotiate uh, what we uh, do look at as a fiscally conservative but yet educationally robust package uh, with Discovery Education, and we'll get into the details of that shortly. Um, and another ease of use piece is that it can easily be synced with PowerSchool, our student information system, as well as ClassLink. And so students, um, no matter what school they're in, uh, ideally from um, K-12 will have the same linked in class link in Bridgeport Public Schools to click on to access their science education. Um, okay, so um, we currently have other products in place. Um, uh, the 912, uh, we don't, but at the other grade bands, we do. And so the uh, approach that we took was to try to phase in discovery education uh, without any overlap. So we don't have to, uh, you know, we're not, we don't have two products aligned at the same time for any given grade band. Uh, but we would start ideally with the um, six year period for the high school next year. So that'd be the first ones to um, kind of have the full access. And that access is the science tech book as they call it. So it's not a textbook, um, but it's an online tech book that uh, provides all the resources uh, and they have uh, ability to print as well. Um, that's for our high school level. Um, so K-5 right now has one more year with H&H, &H, and we've got workbooks uh, on order that'll be in all of our K-5 classrooms for next year for uh, those science learners. So we wanted to try to continue that for the next six years. So starting with the 23-24 school year uh, and for the next six, there will be a print for our K all K-5 students every year, which um, I hope is welcome news. Again, all pending your approval, of course. Um, and then the, uh, that year, that 23-24 school year, K-5 learners will uh, start the Discovery Education platform. The nice thing that they are willing to do is uh, Mystery Science, uh, which is that third bullet point there. It's a, a very engaging um, kind of short videos that um, uh, provide a hook for students and teachers to kind of engage kids within a science lesson. Um, it's one of the biggest uh, pieces I've heard as feedback from our staff, especially at the K-5 level of, you know, wherever we go, let's make sure we have mystery science. So uh, despite them, you know, not having the full access to discovery education for an, one more school year, uh, that mystery science uh, access will be granted for the entirety of this for all K-8, or pardon me, K-12 um, grades. 
Um, so for the next two school years, we still have a contract with uh, Activate Learning that um, um, is the iQuest. So that's our 6-8 uh, grade band at the moment. Um, again, Mystery Science will be uh, accessible to them throughout those these two years while we do have them at no cost. Um, and then we would begin a six-year period, so it would be the third phase in grade band, uh, the 24-25 school year. Um, and again, we looked at this phase and approach to ensure we're not uh, at, you know, overly spending um, in any given school year, but also ensuring no gaps kind of in our resources. Um, so there are great supports for uh, our students uh, that have special needs and our English language learners. Um, both English and Spanish are embedded within the tech book, and so they can easily toggle uh, right back and forth. Um, and then the other language uh, can be used. They, it um, meshes nicely. I've got a screenshot you'll see shortly, but both with Chrome and Microsoft's browsers uh, to translate into any languages that they support. Um, there's guided reading for students uh, who might have reading difficulties. Um, there, uh, again, are paper workbooks in addition to the digital tech book, so, and they mirror each other nicely, and so it's, uh, what's, what you have on paper is going to be similar to what you're looking at. So, uh, for, again, for students with special needs that need a little extra support, those supports are there. Um, and then in this I thought was great, there are two Lexile levels for all texts, and so um, A is grade level, and then B is uh, approaching grade level, and so um, students who uh, need even just a reading support within their science classroom can get that through, uh, through this program. Um, again, great team at Discovery Education. Uh, they are, uh, again, in the contract providing uh, PD uh, and even virtual office hours. Uh, they're very flexible with that, too, uh, in that if we don't need all of the hours in one given year, they will accumulate and use them next. Um, and again, they uh, not just the winner, uh, but also um, kind of the most pleasant to work with, deal with, and uh, interact with. Um, uh, and so we're, um, we did our homework and we did look around to see uh, where else is Discovery Education. Um, and uh, they are all over the country, including Miami-Dade and Fairfax, to name a couple. There are other uh, large districts that they're in. Um, and then locally, we've got, um, again, Danbury, Stanford, Greenwich, uh, Meriden Public Schools, who um, uh, they've got a very data kind of center, very digital kind of platform. Uh, and they've got um, not, uh, they, they're in their second term of agreement with them. And so they've been over 10 years. Um, you know, again, most of these agreements are around six. And so these uh, are a bunch of school districts that have renewed, which uh, we take to be, you know, a good sign. Um, so again, the uh, special needs and EL supports, um, guided reading. Um, you can see kind of here, um, this box kind of pops up, so you can highlight, right when you highlight, that pops up. Uh, you can click to speak the text. Uh, you can highlight, you can save those highlights for later. There's lots of um, kind of options, again, to help um, students. And again, the different Lexile levels for those um, texts. Um, the EL support, uh, again, this is an example of Haitian Creole. I know we've got a population of uh, Haitian Creole students. I've met some great ones in Bridgeport Public Schools. Uh, and this is a translation of a biology lesson into Haitian Creole. Um, again, just as an example of some of the ELL supports. Now, as I said, there's uh, a difference in the English reading level. And so it can be, again, at uh, A or B, and that's for all of their core texts. And so, um, again, try to make sure we found a, a product that's going to be accessible to every single one of our learners here in Bridgeport. Um, so uh, the funding is just shy of $2.7 million. It is uh, 2.665. Uh, that does span uh, a year period of time in all K-12. Um, well, Ms. Siegel, our CFO, is most certainly involved in negotiations uh, and has agreed on the fiscal nature of the final contract that I shared with all of you. Um, it would ensure some solid ground for science education uh, for the next eight years, uh, again, with a consistent platform. Um, and again, your uh, support and approval would be very much appreciated and I think very beneficial to the students in science education here in Bridgeport. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, I'm, used to, I'm just used to seeing the score sheets and I just want to, I'm curious to know, um, I know this is like a whole big, basically a whole big score sheet in a different format, but um, I'm interested to know the differential between the first place run, first runner, and the second runner. Well, so the the summary that I provided with the total 
Uh, so of the 21 categories, there were 10 wins for discovery, four and a half for, um, actually it's off now. Let me, I've got it here. So this was um, the kind of boiled down to it category wins. What were the categories? Uh, so the categories were, uh, there were seven. So we looked at the, uh, essentially uh, highlighting the quality of the product as viewed by our teachers and uh, leadership staff for special needs learners, uh, English language learners. Oh, there weren't 21. What was the 21? So we, we took those seven right. and we asked them in the three different grade bands. So same oh, questions gotcha. for K-5, 6-8, right. and 9-12. Um, so as to not have, um, you know, really let people speak to the grade so level which, there. Which, you know, grade, which one of the, the upper grade levels lean toward and lower grade levels lean toward? So them? discovery one, all of them. All the grade levels. All the grade levels. And, and specifically, the, um, the special needs learners and the relation to everyday life for our students was a category winner at every single grade level. Uh, but the overall winner was discovery for each of those. Um, I'm sorry, Joe. But no, I'm, no, yeah. no worries. You, you, you get a little more, more more in it. depth into the yeah. reason for my question. Now, the, re the reason I want to know the uh, price differential is because if it's a $500,000 differential, what does that $500,000 buy? It buys us a much better product, blah, blah, blah. If it's a $10,000 differential, I mean, we don't have to really account for $10,000 of a differential between Activate, Learn, and Discovery. <laughs> so well, you have to also understand if we went with multiple products like we currently have, you're not going to be able to negotiate the the best deal possible so as you add up different products for different grade levels um it could end up being more money it could be slightly less but i think to what mr henry mentioned is i think the teachers and the district was looking for something that would be consistent all the way through that students would be able to access and um you know to be honest with you we've had a little bit of issues with one of the companies that we currently are engaged in contract with um, that we, you know, that didn't go over well during this process. Um, so I think that, you know, seeing what the teachers felt would be best um, to utilize within the classroom. And as we, we kind of talked while we were looking for the, um, the PowerPoint to put up on the screen, it is something we really want to make sure that teachers are going to utilize within the classroom with their with their students in the class and not shy away from, which um, can be problematic, especially at the, the lower grades. And to be able to have not just digital resources for the younger learners is important because we know when they're on whether it iPads or, or devices and everything is done through a digital platform, Something gets lost with a lot of our kids. It gets clunky. You know, there's issues logging in, teachers wasting time. So to be able to have that hard copy as a backup is going to be critical, especially for our, our youngest learners. All right. So that was my final question. Uh, as far as the, okay, as far as the science, and um, I see we got some consumables here for the yes. K25 and also kits for the kits that are going to help. What okay. grade? So the kits are for three five, and our logic was that the uh, science materials at K one two should be sort of general uh, office supplies, classroom materials, things that the school can supply on their own, uh, and then those kits uh, for three five. Um, the uh, initial year are the full kits, and then there's refills every single year as part of the package, as well as K five print every single year. Um, so. Uh, and, and that's one of the big things that um, I know we made sure was part of the package and also um, drove the cost to where it is, but making sure that that print is going to you know, be there every single year for our especially youngest learners. And as far as the professional developments, I noticed there was five for the nine through 12 and then 14 divided through the rest of the levels. Uh, five days, I believe. Five day, yeah. Um, five, five and 14 to be consumed, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, and, and the, the nice thing, again, the flexibility with there, within there is that if we find that we haven't used them, they don't dry up, they can be carried over to the following year. If we find that, you know, this is a big ask and our teachers need more support, we can pull some of those in earlier and also have be flexible with where we use those grade band-wise, which, um, you know, again, they're, 
a really good team at Discovery that um, I've worked well with uh, just kind of getting to this point, and I envision it uh, continuing going forward if possible. I was imagining that maybe the K-5 would need a lot, a little more support than a, spe- than a specialist in the science. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, again, especially with the K-5 teachers that don't have a science specialty and a science background, um, the, the support with the print, the support with the mystery science piece of it, uh, then as well as the PD that they're going to provide, I think that between all of those, we should be able to properly support those. What's what's in the kits? Uh, I, they align with the uh, units that they've got. Um, so uh, one of them has a, a set of ramps, uh, varying angles, uh, along with um, uh, different weights cars to kind of go down, test the difference in mass, test the difference in angle uh, to speed at the bottom. I believe that's one of the fourth or fifth grade kits. Um, do you have any examples uh, that you could share with the full board next time? Or I'll be prepared for it with them, sure. I would love to see it. Yeah. Or even just email it to the rest of the board. It's not just it. <laughs> That's what I have to Present do. it to the full board. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Lombard, any questions? Um, no, I think he's answered everything. Uh, I wrote questions, but they were answered along the way. Oh, Mr. Benahan, you have your hand up. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. No question, but I have to say thank you, Mr. Henry. You always do amazing presentation, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Benahan. And Mr. Sokolovic, to your point, just to kind of put it in perspective, I mean, it's about $337,000 per year for the eight years. It's... Uh, slightly less actually than what we're paying when we piece together the three grade bands of mathematics over six years. So I think it's comparable and we, Arlene, again, beat them up pretty good. <laughs> I can attest to that. that. <laughs> it, was, um, it was good. No matter the investment, science is worth it. <laughs> I just have a point if you could just clarify for me. So K through five are going to have the tech books available and the mystery science kits just so we can finish out the last year of the other contract? Uh, Not exactly. So the mystery science is the only thing from Discovery that will be available for next year. Uh, They've got we've uh, made an HMH workbook for the last year of that um, uh, contract. And so they won't get the print and begin their sixth year until the following school year, 23-24. But they will have mystery science access for this upcoming school year. Okay. Um, And part of my plan is to, and I've got a couple um, who are interested in being part of this, um, but uh, and again, discovery is uh, flexible. Uh, give access to a few of those teachers that really want to get started with this next year, uh, and then let them help lead the transition when we do switch over from HMH to discovery. Again, pending uh, approval uh, for the um, 23-24 school year. Okay, uh, I apologize. I'm just going to repeat it again, only because I'm looking at the documents and it's saying that we're going to have tech book for our elementary schools starting 2023. And it also says Mystery Science Kit 2023. Uh, do you have the page number of the contract that you're looking at? You could just get all the elementary schools, uh, or this one in particular, I'm looking at Wilbur Cross. So the way that they've laid this out in this lengthy contract is a little difficult to follow. So um, there should, let me try to find where you're Wilbur Cross. Uh, so they appear on page 38 for the very final year of the um, a mystery access or mystery science access. Um, and then there's a line for the mystery education science bundle starting 22-23. So it'll be next school year at Wilbur Cross. Uh, there is a line that's on page 28. Um, and then the elementary school, the uh, science tech book per student start date is 7 Um 
and that is the middle school. Okay, I see where you're looking at. I'm looking at page 22 of 42. The dates are different. So when I'm looking at the product name, start date, end date. I do. Start date is 7 1 23, correct? Yes. And so that would be for grades K 5 for to begin the 23 24 school year with access to the tech book. So the mystery science access is the uh, on the bottom line there for the entire school for that period of time, but it's also listed in two other places for the years outside of that period of time. Is that? Okay. And we did go back and forth a bit with the way that they laid this out. Um, so there's on page 28 is next year's mystery science bundle for Wilbur Cross. Again, no tech book access, but the mystery science. Okay. And the other two refer to middle school access. <clears throat> now on page 38 is the entire school for the very last year for mystery science. So just for Wilbur Cross. Okay, I see it. Thank you for the clarification. Not easily listed in the document. Agreed. And uh, evidence of our CFO's wonderful work can be seen in the very last page, Exhibit E. Uh, we have some um, off ramps, if you will, in case things go awry based on some previous experience. Um, so there are some details in there that we wrote up uh, from our end that were agreed upon. Okay. That was actually my next question is who develop the additional terms in it that for was, the terms for service and agreement. So that's our language. Uh, yes. Correct. Exhibit E is. That was per my request to Ms. Siegel because of some of the issues we had to deal with that were eventually resolved but um, with a previous vendor this year that we did not have to want to have to go back to the table. We had some leverage because there was a phase in of other grade levels in a different product in a different uh, content area, but we didn't want to be all in for an eight year commitment without having any recourse if the product didn't live up to the expectations that we were promised at the beginning. Is the PD in person or is it all virtual? Uh, there's uh, options for both. Um, there are virtual office hours that they have set up, and those, I believe, are only virtual, but the rest uh, can be um, either. Okay. Um, they put, there's more limits on the number of people in person for their contract, yeah. but um, so I'd imagine we'll do a bit of both. So you, can, you can pick and choose which ones you want mm -hmm. to play. Any additional questions or comments? Oh, no, thank you. At this time, I'll entertain uh, a motion to move this in front of the full board for the Discovery Education Science contract. Motion to move to Discovery Education Science con contract to the full board for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. This will be presented to the board at the next meeting this coming Monday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is uh, the special education update. Tonight we've invited uh, Ms. Lauren Lucas and Bridget Corcoran, who are two of our special education supervisors. Okay. I'll get you here. Um, who have been helping with leadership within the department in the absence of 
uh, a director um, during the search, continual search for someone to head the department. So they've done a great job in stepping up and being able to provide uh, the update for tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us board and visitors and guests. Um, Lauren and I are really excited to share with you uh, really a general overview of what's been happening in the department, um, at least recently, if not since the last update. Uh, we've also collected quite a bit of data, some of which answers the questions that were posed to us and other that probably goes beyond those questions. And so we're happy to talk about any of it. So Lauren and I are both going to share some of our updates from the Office of Specialized Instruction. Um, a few targeted areas of focus that the department has been focused on is planning for extended school year services this summer. Um, that will commence on July 5th and run through July 27th. Uh, we're looking forward to 17 robust days of services for our young people who do have extended school year. We are working together, the six supervisors, uh, to ensure that the articulation of all young people from whatever school or program they're currently in to next year's program, whether that be in the same building or if they are transitioning into uh, new buildings and spaces. So for example, our pre-K students headed to kindergarten, our elementary students to middle school, middle school to high school, high school to life. So there's quite a bit of work that goes into ensuring that all of those services are intact and appropriate. We have been working as a district on transition planning. And often that word is confused because historically we think of transition as transition to high school or transition from high school. And as it relates to specialized instruction, transition planning actually starts at the pre-K level. We start thinking about where a young person is going for their life at as soon as they come through the doors. And so the state has recently changed the transition age and we are obligated to ensure that all specialized instruction transition planning is in place by a student's 14th birthday. So we've tasked the district and all of the special educators in preparing that transition plan at the annual review prior to the 14th birthday. This was a pretty heavy lift because this hadn't been done before. And so we engaged them in professional development with CERC, uh, with ourselves. Uh, we put ourselves through some rigorous training and we are working with the state on our compliance to improve our ability to appropriately transition and document that work. So we're really excited about that. The last celebration would be hiring. As we sit here living and breathing, we anticipate starting the next school year fully staffed in the Office of Specialized Instruction. And we can all knock on wood right now and pray to everything we love that that is actually true. We've carried a pretty high rate of vacancy throughout the course of the year and worked really hard to cover those services. And we are very dedicated and the district is as well um, as evidenced by the fellowship program that the district is in partnership with CREC. We have just met and placed nine fellows. These are individuals who are current teachers uh, in district. They are um, very dedicated to the work of Bridgeport. They identify that all students are gen ed students first, but they do want to support the young people with IEPs. And so they have made the decision to cross endorse and go through training and that is with the support of the district and they will be placed as special educators in the fall. So that's truly helping us to fill those vacancies. Lauren has a few topics. Yeah, I was just gonna note they'll be placed in a special education position with a uh, durational shortage area permit. Yes. So they will be a certified special educator for that, that time. Um, we're also working with the state. Um, the state is implementing a new IEP system. It's going to be a statewide system. So we are moving from frontline IEP direct over to CT SEDS. Um, we've been working very closely with the state. They actually partnered with us to do six cohorts of trainings to get all of the staff trained at once. Um, so we started that last week on Wednesday. We have another training this Wednesday and they go all the way till June 16th. Um, there's six cohorts, two trainers from the state training all simultaneously. So all special educators and related service providers will be trained on the IEP quality. Um, so it's all about 
quality writing and IEP, you know, aligning the IEP goals and objectives to the, the core um, standards. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we also did one cohort training with all of the administrators and some identified people in the buildings to, you know, take this information back into to give it out to their schools. Um, Mr. Tassani has also been working really hard with us, with our principals and our leaders in the buildings to do um, trainings on IEPs. Um, I trained all of the principals on IEP hotspots, we called it, basically um, all the spots in the IEP that you should be looking for to keep the IEPs in compliance before they leave the building or are finalized. So to just extend to that, so what Lauren did was train them, um, gave them examples of IEPs that were pulled, some were well-written IEPs, some were poorly written IEPs, and some, um, frankly, were not even, I mean, they were mind-boggling. And then they were asked to go back, and when we brought them back for the second cohort meetings regarding the IEPs, they were asked to go review their own building staff's IEPs, bring some examples of what they thought was well-written, what they thought could use improvement, and what they thought was really troubling. Um, and then we had conversations around that. So um, I think one of the big things, and we'll talk later when it comes to some of the work with the administration, is really putting some big bets on our principals and assistant principal, since they are the building leaders and they are the conduit between what's happening with the teaching staff and with the department um, and the supervisors at the district level. And then lastly, um, we're also working with Marlene for the ESSER grant to bring in some resources and um, trainings for teachers for next school year. So we're excited about that as well. So the questions posed to us were related to schools that have high special education populations, um, wonderings about the growing needs and um, what better way to determine what your needs are than to dive deeply into data. Um, we're exceptionally grateful for this ask uh, these were really good questions that allowed Lauren and I the opportunity to really dive deeply into the data. And I'm a data person, so I just get excited. And throughout the entire process, we were brainstorming all of the ways this is going to support us as a department as we move forward, as well as supporting the schools. Um, we're actually planning to share this information. Um, does this clicker work? Yeah. It does. I think so. Uh, is it ready to go? Send it to me as a PDF. Oh, oh it, as, a PowerPoint. as a PowerPoint, it's a PDF. Oh, so. Um, lesson learned, my apologies. So if you, you can skip the next slide and just go on to the next one. Yep, keep going. Oh, you have to scroll. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this gives you a year to date at a glance of the numbers within district. Um, there's a fine print note at the bottom that shares that this is data that was analyzed from power school and frontline. Uh, these two data collection outlets or supports that we have are fantastic, but sometimes getting them to talk to each other can be really complex. So the numbers reported there are what we found as close to the, as close as they could be on Saturday. So <laughs> This is um, the overview that shows the number of students in district. This is inclusive of young people who are placed in out of district specialized instruction programs and children attending charters, magnets, and other, dis other schools in other districts. As we're sitting here today, unless something has occurred today, uh, 210 students are pending el eligibility which means that an initial referral has been made to specialized instruction. Throughout the course of this year, 547 students have been determined to be ineligible for specialized instruction. We have 798 referrals that are currently pending and eligible. I didn't include in this number the total number of referrals for the year because those students who are eligible for services are counted as those with IEPs. I'm sorry to no, please. the presentation, try to save questions towards the end. No, you're fine. It's 798 referrals pending and eligible? Pending and ineligible. Yeah. So there were 547 that were closed as of five school days before today. Okay. Um, and 
those students were determined to be ineligible for services. So that number 798 includes the ones we don't know yet that are in process okay. and those ineligible. The total, total of every referral this year is 1,449. For the purposes of comparison, last year we saw at the end of the year, not quite year to date exactly, but in another four weeks time, 1,184. The COVID year, 1920, was 1,294. You see a lesser number that year because that year all referrals stopped per state mandate. And the increase last year was in large part us getting caught up. Um, we're still feeling the effects of that this year. The last typical year we experienced was 1819. Yes, that's right. And that was um, 100, or sorry, 1,617. As you look at the slides contained within the packet that was shared with you, and we're certainly not, there's no need to go slide by slide this evening, but these are the data points that you'll be looking at broken down by school. They will include the total number of students in a school or program, the number of students with an IEP, those pending eligibility and ineligible in one line, and students with 504s. So if we go on to the next slide, we see our referral rates. So when we're looking at any school's current population of individuals with an IEP, looking at the referral rates is really important. As a district, we are referring one student for every 34. Now, remember, that's not just young people who are in our in-district schools. That's inclusive of everyone at a charter, um, out of district placement, students who elect to go to school in Stanford. And then you see we've broken it down by developmental level, given the ask in the request about um, each level and what the high special ed education rates look like. We go on to the next slide. Thank you so much. There is contained within your packet one of these for every single school. Um, and certainly, as I said, there's no need to belabor this. We can take questions um, after tonight's presentation. If questions arise following this conversation, we're happy to field those questions. You have the at a glance on the left, and the bar graph represents the black line across the top is the total number of young people in the school and then by grade. This is my first foray into bar graphs, so thank you for the challenge. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, the second line, the red line, are the students within that school or grade level with IEPs currently. Green shows us the number of individuals identifying as female. The blue is individuals identifying as male. On some of the sheets, I'm realizing you can proofread all you want, but you're still going to catch things. On some of the sheets, orange represents females and green represents non-binary. It is indicated in the legend at the bottom of each slide. And the purple number is the referral number. So that's the number of young people who are in process or were determined to be ineligible. This information is really important to us when we're looking at the rates at which young people are being referred because if we see that an individual school has a higher rate of individuals with IEPs or being referred, it flags to us as a department that we need to engage the administration and the program in a conversation. We need to talk about why, what's happening. I think oftentimes folks will jump to this assumption that something's wrong, but that's certainly not the case. It's not about wrong, it's about what and why. And as I mentioned at the start of the conversation, diving into the data directs us to those conversations. Some of the schools at which we see the lowest rates of individuals with specialized with IEPs um, are, I, I can name them, but the percentages are at 5%, 8.6%, 10 and 12%. Those are the five lowest percentages of schools. The highest have 30, 25, 28% of their population. Some of that could be just housing programs over the years where there was space. Yes. Not necessarily they originated in that school. 
assignments were and classes have been placed because of open classrooms at buildings. We're trying to be a little bit more creative in allowing students to be able to go to their neighborhood school um, or stay in a continuum like we have piloted this year with our SOAR program over at Dunbar where we had space and kids will be able to stay from kindergarten all the way through the exit eighth grade. Um, that's could be extremely expensive, um, but we're hoping that we can do more. Uh, Lauren, for example, has come up with some ideas that may service students better. Um, getting a, a, not only a special education teacher support, but also a gen ed um, teacher uh, support as well for students in our youngest grade. So, data points. How do those comparisons? Well, how do they compare in relation to the grade level? Those high and low percentages. You know, are they are they? You know, it's it's five, an interesting question. So I'll use Skein as an example. It's pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, that percentage is sixty eight percent. Most of our pre-K three and four young people that come in and through SCAIN come for the purpose of specialized instruction. Those young people, when they move up to kindergarten, often move with the program that's determined for them to be appropriate. And it isn't until a young person's sixth birthday that we assess again and really dive into what those needs are. So our kindergarten classes, you'll see throughout, are relatively high. As we get to know young people and they grow and develop, often those needs will change. I tend to see that the percentages lessen through elementary school and then start to ramp up again right. at the middle school level. Um, and then interestingly, start falling off for 11th and 12th grade. Uh, there's a, many reasons why that may be, but I think as you go through and look at the graphs, you can actually track and see how the, the information flows at the grade level. Thank you. The programs that Superintendent Destani was referring to are annotated on each slide in just you see special programs. So it will tell you the number of classes that are solely with individuals with IEPs. I have a question. Is the drop off in 11th and 12th grade do, do we have data that would show that they're still in those particular grades or, have, or are no longer attending Bridgeport schools for one reason or another? So I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah. I think some of it has to do with you're just not identifying kids at that point. They've already been identified. And some of it could be um, in certain areas dropouts, to be honest. Um, students that have selected to leave on their own for a number of reasons. Um, is it permissible to no longer identify as special needs at a particular age? At 18, if a young person is their own guardian, they can elect to not have specialized instruction. Worst, or if they exit prior, just, right. and that's the goal, is, yes, is yes. for every student to be able to exit on their own um, and no longer qualify. And that's part of why we did started to do a lot of training because we noticed some troubling trends in certain areas of what could be causing some students who should be exiting after a few years to not exit. Um, and hopefully we can remedy that, remedy that going forward so more kids at the, the tier one instruction in the classroom that they, they need and they deserve, so they're not relegated to being pulled out um, and they spend more time with their non-disabled peers. To that, I think the referrals do rise when you do see the transition from pre-K to K, or if you have uh, students leaving a, a primarily pre-K to six school and then going to a, a K-8. So, they're at a smaller neighborhood school that everyone kind of knows them and they can kind of get through and then they transfer to another school and some of those needs become a lot more evident and that's where I think we see a lot of the referrals at some of those those grades. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, 
couple of questions. 26,000 student number is inclusive of all the students that we may be potentially on the hook, including um, charters, private schools. And charters, magnets. Do we have um, any way to break it out? I know you got the overall number, 34, 1 and 34 is the overall number. Do we have any way to break it out? For public school students versus charter school students who are specialized instruction, because I'm curious, I'd be curious to know of if there's a disparity in the percentages, which I kind of suspect there is and will be more heavily weighted with students with more needs. So I have some of the data that was used. Um, we have a couple of workbooks that were utilized to get to this point. Um, and that it's quite a bit of data, but we're, we're happy to share it. We could certainly break down those numbers. Uh, this will require a magnifying glass because of the way it printed or a picture from your phone. <laughs> and then Zoom. And then Zoom, <laughs> which is how I do it because I can't see anything. Um, but what it indicates is every school, the actual numbers. It, I didn't separate it by district schools as a group. No? Okay. But this does give you a little. So you want to use my phone? Hmm. <laughs> I'll look. I'll, I'll look at it because it's gonna. It's gonna take. But a... we could certainly break it down uh, by in district versus out of district. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be curious because there's all. The... At the very bottom of this very thin graph, it shows the percentage of students who are in district versus out of district. Right. 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 245 young people in specialized instruction outplacements. There are 6,189 young people who are in other. There is a slide for other as well. Um, and other is those magnets charters that we talked about. 439 young people in the other group um, have an IEP. And I'm looking to see if I pulled the percentage there. No, but I can certainly do that math. Um, you, you can get back. You can get back to us. I'll get back to it later if you if you like. That's no no issue. I just yeah, my own personal knowledge and the I'm just always on our looking. Speaking yeah. of which, that leads me to my next question. Mm -hmm. I notice in almost every single school, every single grade, with few exceptions, that males far outpace females in special education and IEPs. Now, is that because males are more biologically imperative to need specialized services? Because we've got more females in the district than males, correct? So all things being considered, it should be at the very least pretty much equal or females slightly outpacing males. And see, when, when, when I see disparities like that, my first thought is, possible bias absolutely and is, is there I'm not accusing anybody of bias i just say it's a possible bias because there's a disparity is there any like anti bias trainings and stuff when specialized education is looking at whether a student is being over identified because of gender maybe or other factors so that's why we've, we've begun the, the the pd and the training especially for the administration because a lot yeah. of times there's not enough data to support going to an, to PPT. So we're, we're often going because of behaviors that are being exhibited um, and qualifying students based on that. So again, let's be honest, males, we're a little bit more immature than females. So we tend to act up a little bit more in the, in the classroom. So that the driving determinant on whether they go to PPT rather than utilizing data that supports it. So that's part of why supervisors are spending a lot of time to make sure that accurate data is being collected prior to going to PPT um, to make sure we're not over identifying one subgroup more than any other. Right. I, I kind of take a little bit of exception to that perception that males and females, uh, I think it could also be if I'm going to use ourselves in this room as an example. Miss uh, Perez got angry and she slammed the table. And if I got angry and I slammed the table, 
Might be a little loud of me slamming the table. And Miss Perez slamming the table. I don't know. Maybe she'll be louder than me. But um, the reactions on the other side of the table may be different from um, Miss Perez slamming the table and myself parent the table based on our gender and based on societal norms. So it may be more likely that I'm sent for an evaluation as opposed to Miss Perez sent for an evaluation and we have the same behavior. That's because that's that's something we hear about in society all the time that we're trying to get away from is labeling genders label because the opposite label of that is which I also hear on the other side of the coin is girls aren't good at science and technology boys are more aggressive these are stereotypes we've had throughout society that are ingrained within ourselves throughout a long time so there may be some tr biological truths to those things but they may not be I think there's so many reasons why subgroups are identified as any one other label, whether it's specialized instruction or not. And that anti-bias training is crucial. We talk in specialized instruction quite often about how when we sit at a PPT table, it's necessary to recognize that most often, most of the educators look like me and the family doesn't. And so we name that. There are times in conversation where we have to say, we acknowledge that this table is surrounded by white women. And there are so many elements of a young person that are necessary to take into consideration. There's so much brain science that speaks to why boys more than girls. And I'm certainly no neuroscientist, but I, I do get excited about the why. But while there may be scientific reasons why, I think there's also societal reasons why, to your point, and it's national. It's not Bridgeport, yeah, no it's doubt. national. And, and we are looking deeply at over identification, not only gender, um, but race, ethnicity, age, which is where we kind of started this conversation today. Absolutely, and, and I, know, I know it's not Bridgeport in particular, and it's specifically, it's all over the world, but we hear in Bridgeport, if we don't name it, we don't recognize it, we can't fix it here. And then maybe the rest of the world can take their examples from us. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments, Mr. Lombard? No. Mr. Benham? Not sure if he's still with us. Uh, I do. I want to go back to. I'm here, Ms. Ms. Uh, do you have any questions or comments? Yes, I have something to say. And I, ha I can say a lot, but I don't want to go because then the meeting is going to be so long, we're not going to go to fit. Um, so we won't send it because I write everything. Oh, yes. I just want to know, is the parent aware about all this new change, the new update for why, you know, for healthy future, and the parent understand the, what's going on with the uh, special need and especially with different language? Are you referring to the new um, platform, the CTS platform? Yes. So there is... Um, modules online for parents to access and it's something that we are working on to make sure that that's available to all the parents it's an online training um, as well as other community resources that are providing that training for free and speak to your sweat pack oh yeah we actually um asked mr tessani if we could start a sped pack um and it was something that we were going to bring to the board at a future date so <laughs> And question, and another question. And there, I not question. It's a little comment, maybe. Um, they maybe separate, you know, the public of, you know, like, like you said, public school with the data with the other schools because you're not gonna put it all together, the data, or you separate data with another for charter school. I think I'm hearing your question is, did we separate the in-district students from charter students? Yeah, charter school, you know, ch charter school students with public school. You're not gonna put it. You're not putting together, or you have a the amount of the data for charter school and the one for public school. Yes, in the package of data that we provided, there is a slide that is labeled "All Other," and within that, you'll see that it indicates charters, magnets, and other schools in other districts in the state of Connecticut. Okay, thank you. No more You're questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna go back for the correct fellows. You said there's nine teachers. I was curious at what schools, are they at a particular school that you saw interest? Was it spread out? We, we offered it to everyone in the district. We had 25 teachers apply for the fellowship. They were vetted through uh, 
HR and Michael Brosnan and through recommendations and we narrowed it down to um, 19 were made available. And it sounds like to me there was some folks that then decided to change their mind once they were notified. Um, the six that were not chosen, um, they were told um, maybe not yet, but maybe down the road that they would have another opportunity. Um, but, you know, we were hoping that all 19 that showed interest and were chosen would, would uh, come to fruition. But it sounds like that there was some that decided against it um, ultimately. Okay. And then the durational uh uh, what is it? Durational shortage permit. Is that only for one year or is it? It's actually dependent on the program you're in. Some people can get a DSAP for one year, others for three. I anticipate this will be for three, although it will only take these individuals a year to reach their credentials. Um, and to answer your question about where, some of the teachers preferred to remain in their building and others asked for different buildings. We did our best to honor um, while also matching teachers with populations we thought would be a good match. Um, and they'll be spread out from K through high school. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Of course. They had to come from a non, another non-shortage. They couldn't come from another non-shortage area. So Matt, we weren't going to take from, from the math department to fill and just create another hole. So these folks had to come from an area we would be confident that we would be able to fill their job um, with a certified staff member. Okay. And there's a commitment as well to staying in a special ed placement um, where there was, you know, we signed an MOU with the BEA to make sure that the commitment was there for three years. Is it three years upon receiving their certification or three years? Starting next year, so three years with the DSAP. Okay. And that may have been the reason why some folks decided that they weren't going to try. <clears throat> they had to remain for three years. Do they, did these uh, opportunities allow them to fall back into their old position if it didn't work out for them? Not exactly into their same, because obviously they would be displaced, so someone else would take their classroom. Um, and, you know, they that, but that could have been also mm -hmm. that they did not have an opportunity to stay in the building, mm -hmm. that they'd have to go somewhere else, and they like working in the building that right. they're in. I have another question. It's not necessarily per this, but it follows up with a previous teaching and learning. You were supposed to have an audit. So the review, um, we had three ultimate proposals. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing some score sheets. Um, the luckily, the highest bidder was a company that the district a number of years ago utilized in some capacity that. Uh, and we had a negative experience with, so they were automatically eliminated by cost. Um, immediately, they were significantly higher. And the two that, the other two were close in price, um, but ultimately um, doing some research. One it, that is slightly higher has some familiarity with Connecticut and also uh, a similar type size district. And we're just getting the final tallies on that before it's brought to this committee um, and the contracts committee to finalize um, so that negotiation and work can begin. Any additional questions from any board members, comments? Uh, just, just one more. Any open complaints with the state? We have just had to put my hand too. We have not complaints. Um, 
resolution hearings, I would say, but nothing that's three have actually come to us in the past two weeks and all three we were able to resolve before they went to complaint. Well, the state has been reaching out. They typically do that as best practice. They'll let us know something's coming and we have the opportunity to respond and we were able to put corrective action in place and avoid the three that did arise. Awesome. Thank you. I think being proactive this year and really just acknowledging the areas that we know that um, we're struggling in and not trying to um, make excuses or you know try to hide the fact, just being open and honest and asking for support has been extremely well received at the state level. Um, they've been very supportive in helping us resolve any issues prior to going to complaint. Mr. Benaham, you have your hand up. Yes, me, um, Madam Chair, yeah. I have uh, something to say. Um, to the ladies, but now all parents, yeah, I just want to be sure all parents and they don't know how to, you know, how to be get access. All parents have access. That's my, my comment and my question. All parents have access to any way how to get the, this information. Okay, not everyone had to, all parents had to deal with technology. I know some parents, they have a good phone. People think, oh, they got a good phone. They don't have to go through the website. No, we have to understand some parents have a good phone and stuff like that because update, or because they're not to use only numbers. But my question is, all parents have access. Another way, not the website. You know, if they come in a meeting, a PBT, or you send a different language, that's my, my question for you guys. We've, ident we've identified that that is an area of concern. It's one of the reasons that drove the initiative with the SPED PAC, the advisory group for families. Uh, we have an ombudsperson who was brought on board, I'm not entirely sure, a while ago, who we access as a liaison. But we identify that as a department, we need to improve that access. Uh, we can't rely solely on technology. We completely agree with you. And so it's interesting to consider what opportunities might exist for a welcome center, so to speak, or open office hours, ways in which we can reach all families, community events, are ways that we hope to grow to, to do better in that regard. Okay, and I'm gonna follow the question that Mr. Lombard, uh, Mr. Um, Joseph, Joe said about any case. Do we have um, any case about we get sued or, you know, we, we getting sued or something like that? No. No, okay. All right, no more questions, no more comments, Madam Chair, thank you. I have a question based off of the information that was provided to us. How did we develop the rate number, the math behind it? The rate? Yes. It's the, so you've got the total number of referrals, the common denominator divided oh, by. Referrals, yep. not the total enrollment. It's referral to enrollment. Oh, okay. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Questions? Comments? No? I think that concludes the update. Uh, thank you very much for the detail. I know I asked for a lot of information, but um, <laughs> it was helpful. The, the breakdown, I think, is key because you can point it out a lot easier, the difference between males and females. Um, Geographically, as the city changes, and I was curious if we saw increases in certain areas where um, maybe it might be more affordable to move to if you're not originally from Connecticut or even out of or out of the country. So um, instead of making hypotheticals in my head, I wanted to see the data and I wanted to see. Um, see what was the current status. So I really appreciate you taking the time out to do this. We Absolutely. appreciate that you tasking us with it. We, mm -hmm. We're constantly having conversations about, you know, the special ed teachers and their caseloads. And this was eye opening for us to see, you know, the different numbers at different schools. So it helps us to plan for next year. And I have the aggregated and disaggregated, <laughs> but I had to draw the line somewhere. So if you want access to that, we're happy to share <laughs> and continue the conversation. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you. <clears throat>
we're going to move to the sixth item on the agenda, which is an update on Footsteps to Brilliance. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Therese McGuire, the Director of Early Childhood Education, and I am very excited to share our Footsteps to Brilliance update with you. Our goal was to become a model city intervention and through the Footsteps to Brilliance. So we started with our preschool students. Um, we launched December 8th, and as of right now, we have spent almost 10,000 hours on literacy. Our preschool students, which includes our threes and four-year-olds, have read about 2 million words, and they have read uh, 53,000 books as of right now. So to support our teachers, we began December 8th and we did an interactive PD with the Footsteps to Brilliance team and our preschool teachers. So preschool teachers came, they logged on. Um, there are three apps that are included with Footsteps to Brilliance. There's the I Can Read pre-reader. There's the Footsteps to Brilliance, which has two to three levels. And then there's the I Can Read. So our preschool students, we decided would start with the pre-reader app um, our teachers were able to look at the lessons and to design um, how they were going to use this in the classroom. Um, we started with using it with the teachers and students in class first before we launched it um, to the parents because we felt that if our teachers and our parents really understood the apps well and how the students were using it, then they can provide that direct support um, to the families once we launched it to the families. The unique thing about the Footsteps to Brilliance app is it comes in English and in Spanish. So it's one of the first apps that we've seen that is bilingual for our families. The other feature of the app that we like is it is not Wi-Fi dependent. You only need the Wi-Fi to download the app. So we said to families, um, you can pull into school and you can use our school Wi-Fi. And once it's downloaded, you don't need Wi-Fi access anymore. You can go out of the country. They can use it at grandma's house. They can use it in the car if they want. Um, while they're at the restaurant waiting, they can use the app. We can get the data as soon as the app connects back to a Wi-Fi access point. So we're using it both in the classroom and at home. The recommended use is 15 minutes per day, three times a week. Um, we strongly feel that technology is important, but we don't want our students to spend the majority of their day on technology only without that direct instruction. After we launched it with our teachers on January 21st, uh, we sent family letters home. So the family letters included steps on how the family can download the app at home. So each child has what's called a super secret code that goes with their footsteps to Brilliance account. If the parent for some reason forgot their super secret code, Footsteps to Brilliance is linked onto class links. So we gave what's called a quick access card, which looks like my ID. So when the student is on their device, they can just click their card against the class links and it directs them right to the Footsteps to Brilliance app because it's a lot for our students to have to log in using their student ID and their password. So the quick access made it so much easier. If families had difficulty registering, they were directed to speak with their teachers or to call myself and my department and our team would assist them with it as well. Once we felt that the families were established with the app, we did another training for teachers. Um, during that training, we showed the different features of the data reports. So there's a proficiency report and there's a growth report. So as a classroom teacher, I can look at the students using the app and I can narrow it down to class trends. So what skills does the class need? So maybe they're having difficulty recognizing the letter A or I can narrow it down to individual skills. Once I look at that report, I can go into Footsteps to Brilliance and assign extra practice. So if my teacher looks at my data and says, Therese really needs some more time learning the letter A, she can go into the Footsteps to Brilliance app, look at the extra practice and see what's most appropriate to assign to me so that I can further boost that skill. 
we went out to a couple of sites to see how the students and the pairs were using it um, in small group instruction. And individually, we found that the students were very excited about using the app. They were able to share with us what the lesson was about, what books they had read. They also had the ability to write their own books. So some of them were showing like how they drew a person or how they wrote about their trip to the grocery store. Um, of course, developmentally appropriate. So some had just a few letters, some were beginning to form words depending on where they were developmentally. After we did um, the parent letter, we did parent trainings. We offered four sessions, two in English and two in Spanish, um, with the Footsteps to Brilliance team and our team. So parents had the opportunity to say, I've been using the app, here are some questions that I have, or here's a feature of the app that I'm not really sure um, what it's asking me to do. We got really good feedback from the families during those sessions. A lot of the families said, you know, I really wasn't sure how I can help my child at home. So having this app available at home, we can learn together. And some of our students who um, said, I'm learning some Spanish words because I'm not a Spanish speaker at home. So it allows for that exposure as well. Then the final training we did with our preschool teachers is we did what was called virtual office hours. So the teacher can say, I've been using the app and I'm not sure what um, when I'm using the proficiency report, am I targeting the right skills? Um, where can I find some extra assignments? Or I'd like to publish the student book that my student made and give it to families. How can I do that? So we did the three training sessions for teachers. Um, as a point person for our preschool teachers, I felt that to create the buy-in amongst the teachers and the paraprofessionals and the families, I weekly pull the data also, and I've been sending out recognition certificates, the amount of books read, the number of words read, or if I come across some tips that the teachers and pairs can use in the classroom, I'm including that as well. The students are really enthusiastic about the recognition certificates. If that if I send it late on Friday and they have to wait till Monday morning, some of the first questions Monday morning are like, detective mouse is their icon. So they're like, where's my detective mouse certificate? Did she track words read this week or books read? So they're very excited about that. Um, to date, as I said, we began with the pre-reader. We have 26 students who have moved on to the I Can Read app. So we're seeing a lot of great progress. The pre-reader has 26 lessons that are targeted, and then the I Can Read app has 36 lessons. So following our success with preschool, we're moving into the summer months, and we made um, the decision that we're ready to provide this app pre-K to third grade during the summer. So there, we're calling it a roadness to readiness um, challenge. So families will be provided with how to access the app. They will be provided with a little game card that has Detective Mouse on it. So if I play on the app, I color in my box for 15 minutes a day, then I can return it to the school and receive a prize once we're done. We ran a similar challenge with preschool in April. So any student who read 200 words or more on the app received a certificate of recognition and a small prize as well. And then we are going to, with our early reading summer success for K-3 students, we are going to train our early reading summer success teachers on how to use the app so that they can use it as a component of their instruction during the early reading summer success. And then when the school year starts in August, we will train the K-3 teachers so that they are aware of how to use the app and will kind of follow the similar model that we did with the preschool teachers because we found it to be a very successful model. We trained the administrators, so we gave the administrators an overview of what the apps are and the various reports that their teachers can use and how to engage their families as well. And with preschool, we also service um, the community. So we have school readiness sites within district and we have school readiness sites in the community. And to ensure equity amongst our BOE sites and the community sites, I did an overview presentation for our school readiness community directors and the superintendent provided the community with the flyer so that um, the community families can download the app so that they are on an equal playing field with our students when they enter kindergarten as well. So if, if many of you re will remember when we, when we kicked this off last summer um, and 
as Baptiste Perez being new to the board. Um, I believe that over time, this may be one of the most significant initiatives, programs, however you want to call it, that will have impact on the growth and development of our students long term. Um, I, you know, I, I think this is going to be something that, as Ms. McGuire just mentioned, it, you know, it's just not our kids in our, our preschool, in our buildings, but it also gives kids access in the community sites, um, the number of books, the number of words, the access to, to literature and literacy prior to entering kindergarten, I think it's going to have um, a big payoff for these kids who normally would come come in behind their their peers. So um, I'm excited to see as this progresses over the next couple of years, uh, the data points that will show uh, the improvement of our students as they progress through the primary grades here in Bridgeport Public Schools. Any comments, any questions? <clears throat> Mr. Yep. Sokolovic? Yeah, excuse me. Uh, I seem to remember this was open to people, not just children in our pre-Ks, right? Correct? Oh, community side. Community, right? Do we know how many unique users we have? So we've just added um, to the community dashboard. We provided it to the community in January, and we have about 10 students that from the community that also participated in the April break challenge. And when we have our school readiness council meetings, I do just, you know, send a reminder to the providers too. And some of the providers have reached out asking questions to if a family needed support. And we provided in the flyer a QR code so that the family can watch a video to get an overview so that the family can learn all about the app as well. And uh, yeah, registration, having that, QR code will, for, for new families will be much more helpful than a mid-year kind of kickoff as well. Awesome. And I really can't wait to see how it filters into the kindergarten and all yes. the other grades as well. How, how first of all, how was this paid for? Was it, was it uh, ESSER grant or another grant? Yes, sir. ESSER grant. The original. It's, okay, so this will be the second round. This will be something we could highlight. Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I have a question. Um, what's the average words learned for, I guess, pre-K three, pre-K four? So the way the app works is they track the interaction. So every time a student interacts with the word, whether they touch it, whether they reread it, that's the data that the app currently tracks. So we're up to um, 22 million words read, and that's the interaction with the words, but they don't really break it down any further than that. Oh, they don't break it down to like an individual. Oh, but in, I feel like it's already been kind of like tracked when looking at disparities. Um, and I feel like I've heard it in presentations, like the average child goes into kindergarten knowing about X amount of words. And I, I'm sure this is targeting the catch up. Um, and the app is connected to the science of reading, which is what, you know, we're following statewide to, which addresses that specific concern is the gaps when children are entering kindergarten. <coughs> Mr. Lombard? No, I don't have any questions. I'm just happy to see this rolling out so well. Mm -hmm. It was exciting when it was introduced, and I think it's really think the important piece was to roll it out slowly, not to overwhelm teachers. It's been a difficult year to begin with so much happening so i think starting increment and, and moving through it incrementally is going to be something that we'll be able to sustain long term and Ms. mcguire and and anna and the, both the you know the departments have really supported this and the teachers extremely well um so i think you know because of all their hard work it's, it's really been a seamless uh rollout so far and i think my favorite if i could just sure. add was when we were doing the family workshops um at six o'clock at night. Of course, we don't discourage mom from bringing your child. The little girl came on the computer and our footsteps facilitator was from Puerto Rico and the little girl noticed, oh, you're from Puerto Rico, I'm from Brazil. So the presenter asked her, what do you think about the Footsteps to Brilliance app? And she said, I just love it. I am getting so smart and I finally have homework like my high school brothers and sisters. <laughs> so they are always working hard. I'm gonna beat them so, and she, 
pan the camera so we can see the table and how she sets up her app. And then the cutest part was she went over the expectations for the app that the teacher mentions in the classroom. So knowing that particular classroom, to hear her repeat why it's important and why I learned. And she goes, and I'm teaching mommy some of the words she doesn't know. So she goes, my opinion is two thumbs up. And, I, and if that's not the best data, then I don't know what is. That's great. So that's kind of a big thing for you to say that you think it may be one of the biggest initiatives. That's a big statement. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I think we've spent a lot of time that, um, really starting to focus on early childhood education and literacy. And we're putting you know, a lot of stock in that because I think it's important that our kids can read and they can read well um, because that then opens the door for, for learning of, of other content and to explore. So, That's yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that this is going to pay off huge long term. Um, and I think the one thing that we've all agreed upon as a team, Dr. Jenkins and I specifically, is that we need to stay consistent. We need to stay committed. Um, we can't just look at initial data that comes out and, and want to just, all right, this isn't working, let's shift. Because we've done that for the last at least 26 years that I've been here. And um, things have come and gone. I've heard of that referred to as the shiny penny syndrome. Yeah. And, you this know, is great. Let's do this. Oh, let's do this. Let's do this. You know, it's like, keep wait a the shiny penny. Give it a minute. It never develops any really consistency within the classroom. And, um, you know, nothing is done with fidelity. Right. Really see the, the rewards because, you know, and that goes, will lead into the next component in the last agenda item that we'll speak about as well. Thank you. Mr. Benahan, any questions or comments? <laughs> No comment. Thank you. Thank you. All of it? No, ma'am. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to the next item on the agenda, it's a report from Partners for Educational Leadership on the work done with the administration district for 21-22. And Dr. Jenkins is going to join me as well. So, um, come to the table. Yeah. So, um, one thing that is, was evident to me, being an administrator in the district, um, geez, or superintendent, 16, 17 years, um, going to a lot of professional development, going to a lot of meetings, we'll say. Um, there really was a need, and I, I believe the administration was starving for some high-quality professional development to improve their leadership, um, specifically their instructional leadership within their buildings. Also, with so many new hires that we made over the last couple of summers in, uh, in administration, specifically assistant principals, it, there, I, I didn't think there was any better time to embark on this work. Um, so we really wanted to work with a, a quality partner. Um, at the time, the Connecticut Center for School Change, now the Partners for Educational Leadership. Um, we really, we sat, we talked, and um, I immediately knew that this was something that we could partner with them. They would take this endeavor with us and um, our, our administration, our commitment, um, as we talked about, big bet is being placed on our instructional leaders in the district under the guidance and, um, and support of Dr. Jenkins as the chief academic officer. Um, what we wanted to do was provide super support for, to me, um, to a thought partner, and, and it's Richard Lemons. Uh, provide support for central office at cabinet through co-planning and facilitation of leadership team meetings, development structures and routines. Uh, we wanted to plan and facilitate a community of practice for our new principals and input from the leadership team to support implementation of strategy at the school level. Uh, plan and facilitate a community of practice for our new APs, which I think is going extremely well. Provide leadership coaching to principals 
uh, to supplement and extend the work of the community of practice. That's just a that was a broad overview of what we were hoping to accomplish. Dr. Jenkins can be more specific in detailing what's been done so far and where we're at today um, and where we plan to go in the future. Good evening. We began the work with the Partners for Educational Leadership back in June 2021, 20, um, and that was um, Mr. Testani's senior leadership or cabinet, myself, um, Tito Planas, um, Dr. Selena Morgan, and at the time, um, Victor Black. And we began to peel back layers after working with principals and getting feedback from teachers to understand what could be a focus or a high leverage point for um, school improvement and district improvement. So the four areas of strategy or instructional strategy revolved around making sure students had high quality tasks or assignments on their desk, um, making sure teachers feel supported with um, assessment in the classroom, not just high stakes assessment, real time assessment of their students, um, making sure we provide supports for social emotional learning um, coming out of the pandemic and meeting students needs and making sure we provide teachers in the classroom with supports for tier one instruction, not just um, interventions, but what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So our focus um, after looking at data, feedback from school leaders, feedback from teachers, we drill down to those four components that support what we call the instructional core. That's the relationship between the teacher the student and the content. That's the most important relationship that we support in the district, from the district down. So in August of 2021, um, all the school leaders, the special education department, ESL, all the directors, APs, um, Mr. Testani, uh, we spent two days at Sacred Heart I'm learning what high quality tasks look like. Um, high quality tasks promote thinking, cognitive engagement. And then we learned what a high quality task would not look like to develop synergy across all the leaders. So we support teachers most effectively. So that has been the core of the work. Um, when we opened the year in September and October, we began visiting classrooms. And we did notice that not all students had access to, say, high quality assignments, um, especially after the pandemic. Many people feel that there's a lot of learning loss. So, you know, some people would give children maybe a task at a lower level. However, that's not the best remedy. It's better to provide students with on grade level assignments and then provide support in reaching the level of the on grade level assignment. So the executive directors and you know I, we visited classrooms and we identified that you know we could be doing better with those tasks. About 50% were on point and 50% weren't, especially with using some of the products that we had purchased. So we brought the information back to our school leaders and they began to work with us collaboratively district and school to work with teachers and making that revision to what would be happening in the classroom with the use of um, the materials we purchase and providing students access to grade level high quality assignments. So that occurred um, in October, November, December, January. And so we actually um, began looking again at what would be a quality task with teachers. Um, principals have engaged in data collection that involves what we call empathy interviews, actually talking to the teachers about what is a high quality assignment, what supports would they need to create how high quality assignments. And just so you know, all that work is revolved around understanding the system that we're in. There are so many moving parts. So, and that work also has allowed us to develop a shared understanding of the work. So we're more united than we've been 
in the time that I've been in the district, E2, and I've been in the district for 16 years. Um, most recently, in order to just telling a teacher to put a high quality task or high quality assignment on the desk, is it like magic? We've been exploring small, small areas of change, generating ideas for change, because it's there's so small incremental things we do that actually bring about change. Um, one of the best examples, if you think about it with the pandemic, just wearing a mask was a small change that helped flatten the curve. So we're looking right now at small changes to increase the number of high quality assignments children have access to. Um, so that was some of the last work we're doing. Um, in order to advance the work, um, we also are hiring um, teacher leaders. We're expanding upon the number of teacher leaders because the principal is the instructional leader, but we want to make sure that they have some supports as well. And what better support than to provide teacher leaders, people who are already in the classroom doing the work to be a model and a, a mentor and a peer support for other teachers as well. Um, so that's some of the work we started with the partners. Additionally, um, 12 new principals have received professional development a monthly um, and 19 new assistant principals for a total of 31 administrators, about a third of our population being hired within the last one to three years. I think what was evident from initial retreat in August was the need was, was blaring. There was, uh, Richard Lemons did an exercise with the entire group and he put up two tasks um, and asks which one was great appropriate. And everyone immediately thought one was way too challenging for the grade level that students were being asked to, to complete. And the other one was more appropriate. And unfortunately, um, the one that they thought was too high level was an actual example that of a classroom at that grade level um, in another district that his son was asked to do. So that really showed us as a team um, that we had a lot of work ahead of us because we had, we had our principals and assistant principals not understanding the capability of what high quality grade level instruction was in our classrooms. So as Dr. Jenkins mentioned, incremental change, it's going to take time. But to your point, footsteps to brilliance was a big bet that we're placing on helping students um, build a foundation for future success. And this is another huge bet we're placing on our administration to be able to work through their teacher leaders to support teachers in the classroom to make sure our students are receiving the best high quality instruction, tier one instruction, um, each and every day. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll entertain questions. Go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. So the teacher leaders brought on as a result of this program. Right. They sp they're spread in certain schools. Or Every school has teacher leaders. And so they're not. Doing, they're they're not. I would imagine doing anything administrative. No. No. It's purely working right. with the teachers. And, and then is it you? You talked about some of the, the most recent PD being with new hires, the new principals, new assistant principals. Yes. Um, and, and what opportunity are there for this type of PD for even just current existing administration? You know, well, well, so every month, all about 100 of us have professional development. Oh, okay. But the PD for the 12 administrators is focused. Focused. So they get to be in what they call a community of practice and they bring some of the problems and challenges unique to their schools to the small group and it's facilitated by one of the consultants from the Partners for Educational Leadership. Each of the 19 assistant principals have engaged in an um, individual project designed for their school, a problem of practice for their school that they're working on each month as well. So their PD is more focused because they're new. 
So this educational leadership program, when your team all went to Sacred Heart, a retreat, yes, retreat. Was it just your team, or were there other districts there? Too? No, just our team. Just your team. Yes, right. So, so. we'll do that again this coming August again. Um, different focus, obviously. It'll, it'll be a continuation. But uh, again, it, I think it's you know it's a big bet we're placing. Uh, I think one that will pay dividends long term, and Dr. Jenkins has been a you know a catalyst in helping drive this um, with the the partner, the Connecticut Law Partners for Education Leadership. We have partnered, um, Dr. Morgan, um, Tito Planas, and I with some other school districts, um, Milford, Derby. Trying to think of some others. They're mostly inland, but Milford and Derby are the closest to us. So we hear how they are doing some of this work as well. Um, they're more advanced. They've been in partnership with this um, consulting group longer than we have, but we are able to learn from them as well. Yeah, I, I just have a comment. Um, I think it's almost so obvious that everyone needs support and, and guidance and instruction especially the leaders, you know, everyone needs it to, to have that kind of, if, if this is a, if this is a quality consulting group, quality group they're doing with all these districts, you know, throughout Connecticut, um, it's, I, I think it's an important bet. You said it's another big bet that is, does an investment is put, is being put in this area to support the, the upper level leadership because they, they need that as just as much as the teachers do and everything else. So Absolutely. And one of the things that's obvious is that, in the course of a day, the administration can get distracted very easily from focusing on teaching and learning and get hung up on a lot of the managerial and operational components of the job. And this is now, and we've had this conversation, you know, as recently as today, is, is keeping a focus on teaching and learning, um, distributive leadership amongst schools that have multiple administrators to make sure that the building principal, and I had this conversation with a member of the State Department today around a couple of our school improvement grant schools, that the principals are focused on getting into classrooms, not just as a pass by to say, hey, how you doing and be invisible, but to, to do a mini observation, a couple every day to provide feedback to teachers so that they can help grow and cultivate that culture within the classroom, within the school. <laughs> I have a question. Well, what are, are, I know it's hard, you had mentioned Dr. Jenkins, to go from one uh, way all the way up to change, but do you have like a example of an incremental change, a teacher that's been suggested some of our teachers to implement in the, chat, the classroom to have higher quality instruction and an incremental change that's been taken on by our um, administration to keep up the change, aside from just being in the program. Like, I'm just trying to well, conceptualize it. When we visited the 100 class, we visited, Tito, Selena, and I visited 100 classrooms. And when only 50% of those classrooms were using programs that we had invested in, that was the first change. Use, use, use the program. <laughs> Um, so when we're visiting classrooms now, um, teachers need to be using Reading Wonders. It's not an option. They're going to use Into Math. It's not an option. Um, even the older science book, HMH, um, New Dimensions, that's the book we have in K-5, and that's the book we are going to use. Um, so one of the examples is I meet with my principals. I show them their math data. I review with them um, the Into Math book based on the data. So they know what the book looks like. Then I show them a video. We look at the video as an example of high quality instruction. They go and do that with their staff. Um, Earth science results was low. We look at Earth science data. We look at the science dimensions. Why? Can't we make it to earth science? They've spent too much time on science and technology, so their pacing is off. So now the teachers can adjust their pacing. 
So it's not going to change overnight, but those are some of the smaller things that they have been tasked to do. And in providing feedback to principals um, just today, um, when they're observing, if there's 90 minutes for math or 90 minutes for literacy, our teachers using all 90 minutes. So just making sure we're leveraging time. Are they using the resources we provided? Because those resources are directed to the content that we children should be learning, they should know and be able to do. And are they engaging in the instructional strategies? So for literacy, um, the principals and the teachers have been trained in these 10 instructional routines. Which teachers are doing the routines? Which teachers aren't? Principal A told me back in February, K and two teachers were using the routines. One grade one and three teachers weren't using the routines. Uh, what's your plan to minimize those barriers? Um, so now I know in that school, school A, that K, one, and two, and three teachers are using the routine. So throughout the year, um, we've engaged in this, we call it improvement science, the science of improvement, using data, using um, program evaluation through observation, using feedback from the teachers as well. And one last small example, when I was in a mid-year conference um, with the principal, you know, they, it, it's not just for academics, it's for everything. Principal studied struggling a little bit with bullying in the classroom, grade four, and I asked, sometimes children need a purpose. Have you considered book buddies? And um, she's like, book oh, buddies? I said, yeah, sometimes, you know, children need to give back in order to, you know, understand how to be not a, bu a bully, but a buddy. And so she implemented it and she sent me pictures and the behaviors had been extinguished. So just not looking at problems as um, barriers, but opportunities, trying to understand the system um, identify a small item for change, just pairing those kids up. She sent me pictures on my phone of the kids reading aloud. And so now I'm trying to get money to buy um, some biographies for the fourth grade to teach to the kindergartners. So in that meeting with her, when problems emerge, we don't just see them like, okay, we just got to go through the bullying protocol. And we do. But how do we systemically make a change for children in that school? Is that is that some yeah. examples? Okay. And I think the last thing to add is that we have four principal cohorts. About every five weeks, we meet with them, and it, it becomes a safe space. It becomes a a, a place to share, um, to support each other, um, and it's a it's a learning it's a learning opportunity as well that. From our perspective, from a district perspective, we're able to have that open dialogue with our, our principals about some of the challenges, some of the barriers, and they support each other. And uh, there was no rhyme or reason to creating the, the cohorts, but I think through the special ed stuff, today we're looking at initial data from that before we get to the end of the year data. Uh, we created a, a cohort of our school improvement grant school so they could share ideas on best practices on how to leverage the funds effectively and efficiently. So I think all of this together has kind of um, began to move the ball forward. Do we have a lot of work ahead of us? We do. But I think it's creating a culture of professional learning amongst the administration that I know, and I know Dr. Jenkins was shaking her head, hasn't existed in, in a long, long time. Mr. Sokolovic? Oh, uh, yes. I'm trying to figure out how to frame my question. Um, I think I got it now. And um, Ms. Baptiste Perez brings up the point of uh, a question that she asked. She responded with the programs and ensuring schools are using the programs. Now, how do we ensure that the schools are using the supplemental programs and forcing out traditional curriculum. Because I, I, I've heard stories about the poor car grades 
just having all the minutes, all the required minutes in the classroom time is being taken up the minutes that should be doing it, should be getting done at home. When, when we receive feedback that, you know, a program is not being used appropriately, um, an intervention is put in place for the teacher. Um, curriculum is reviewed um, with the teacher. Um, opportunity to say visit another classroom is going to be created to support the teacher so to learn and work with their colleagues and making sure that as we mentioned today in the meeting that the principals are engaging in program evaluation as well through classroom observation that's program evaluation um, the principals have received a tremendous amount of pd from the partners as well as from the directors on which programs are core and which programs are supplementary. So Footsteps to Brilliance, while it's a wonderful program, it is a supplemental. Um, Lexia is a supplemental program. Um, Moby Max are supplemental programs. Those are programs that children work on while, say, a teacher's pulling a small group instruction. So reviewing with the teachers, reviewing with school leaders, what's core, what's supplemental. Those supplementals can be leveraged at home, and that's why we're encouraging the family um, partnership. The core is delivered primarily by the classroom teacher. We've made some adjustments based on feedback as well. Um, and we abandoned one of the supplementals that we felt was being, wasn't effective, wasn't well received, but also being overused. Um, so we monitor the usage and we don't want to create because initially that's what started to happen. It created an environment where schools were trying to outdo each other in usage right. and, and that needed to be reined in because, again, we were getting to, to your point, some schools that were overusing the supplemental, which was taken away from the core curriculum in the classroom. So really making sure that we monitor those reports. So where necessary, we can make the adjustment. But I think she hit it on the head right. And to my point at the beginning, principals and administrators need to get into classrooms to observe <laughs> teaching and learning and provide feedback. If they don't, that's when things could go awry. Thank you. Mr. Lombard. Thank you. Yeah, I was actually just going to bring up, bring that up again. It's, it's so old school. Principal, come into your classroom, <laughs> observe, you know, and, and I know what happens. You get busy. You got the, the, the leaky faucet over here. You got this report you got to do, and, and, and maybe you shove it off onto someone else to do, but that, without that, you'll never know. We could, okay. we could, we could adopt a brand new, amazing text series and, and, and and they're still using the old ones, some of the teachers, because like, you know what, I know this one. My lesson plans are written for right. 15 years around this old book from, from two adoptions ago. And it, I'm not saying it's happening, but I can imagine that it could happen, you know, if. Mr. Sokolovich asked me when we were walking in about social studies. Yeah. The teachers in four through six and the administrators last Wednesday, first time they've had PD probably in decades. Yeah. Like the new the Connecticut social study standards are, are a bit different. <laughs> right. And we, but I'm saying they, I believe they've, we've worked hard this year. Yeah. The work isn't finished, yeah. but there's no director right. that made sure that they right. see those social study standards <sighs> to bring our children right. and teachers yeah. to the 21st century. Yeah. yeah. We trained all our admins. Uh, pre-pandemic with Kim Marshall was here to do the training on the mini observation and gave the data on how if you get in for the mini observations X amount of times, uh, the amount of feedback and the amount of, of eyeballing instruction that you will get during the course of the year and a, a teacher over the course of several years compared to just doing the formal observations, you really get a much better understanding of what's happening in your classrooms in your school. Uh, we talked about that today if we need a refresher because of so many new administrators yeah. um, because there's a lot of value in bringing that to the to the table because yeah. it doesn't take long 15 minutes 
you know, you dedicate 15 increments of 15 minutes. It's, it's so I remember my first or second year teaching, I was teaching eighth grade, and when the principal would just randomly come in, just sit down. I was like, huh. Oh. <laughs> so, so you know you got to be ready all the time, not just like when right. there's a formal observation. Make sure you're using what you got to use. And, and then she knew what was happening and could, could give me feedback. I was a new teacher, you know, so. That, that, like I said, it's old school, but it's important. Well, and we put a, a minimum number of, of time next year in the ele- elementary grades for literacy, for math, for science, and so- social studies. And those schedules need to be adhered to because sometimes some teachers will shy away from the science. Some teachers will shy away from the social studies. So we need to ensure that principals are getting in to make sure that dedicated time is being given to those content areas to prepare students for high stakes tests. And the last thing, just so I understand this program, this is an ongoing, like just a, I, I missed that part. I'm sorry. Well, we will, we will continue the work with the, the partners for next school year. And as you know, we have the funding through SR and ARP dedicated to this for the next school year, or at least the next two school years. Two school year. um, and at that point, uh, you know, the one component that I think is critical are the teacher leaders. That's what I was wondering. And it's it's a very inexpensive but a, a, a high leveraging point that I think if anything comes out of this that we can sustain. For about a million dollars, we can have about 200 teacher leaders wow. throughout the district at different grade levels supporting different content areas, which will be extremely important, I think, in retention of teachers, but also in supporting the number of new teachers that we have in our first, in their first few years of teaching in in Bridgeport. So, and hopefully that'll be a a retention tool to keep those teachers engaged until they can become the next teacher leader in the school. Mr. Benahan, do you have any questions or comments? Question, Ms. Melanchia, thank you. My question was it. answered regarding funding, uh, Sokolovic. Oh, yeah. Okay. We have no further questions. Thank you for the update. Thank you very Thank much. You. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Meeting has adjourned. The time now is 9 11. Lucky 9 11. <laughs> God bless you all. Good night, Mr. Good night. Right hand. Uh, do I still got the record? I'm still here. Oh, my God.